Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, I'm delighted to see the room uh, almost completely filled up now. I'm glad we waited 10 minutes. Welcome to the Nanda and Pamela Shrestha Lecture Series. This is the second of the series, uh, endowed by Nanda and Pamela Shrestha, who are based in the US, but wanted to encourage uh, us at the Social Science Baha uh, to support Nepal scholars. And I say Nepal scholars because it includes non-Nepalese as well, but basically scholars who've uh, written, talked about, uh, and try to help understand uh, Nepal. Um, I, al uh, I also want to say a special word of welcome to uh, Katrin, who's here today uh, at the lecture, and um, want to uh, thank her for her support and recognize uh, the importance of the subject today of commemorating Tony Hagen's work. Um, you've all received the promotional materials that we circulated by email and handed to you as you entered. So I won't bother to go into the details of it. And uh, my colleague and friend Deepak Gyamali uh, will be talking today um, about his life, about Tony Ho Hagen's life, and focusing on how he began as one disciplinarian and ended up as another, and along the way spanned several disciplines. And I found myself resonating with the interdisciplinarity of his work uh, through his time in Nepal. And I think that's what's lacking a lot these days in development discourse. Um, some housekeeping points. Uh, we will run for about 45 minutes with uh, Deepak speaking. And then we'll have question and answer for about 30 to 45 minutes again. Tea and cookies are served after the uh, interaction. Uh, bathrooms, uh, toilets are at the back outside the room. Um, I'll ask that you please uh, mute your uh, mobile phones. Um, I'm sure most of you have done it, but I thought I might remind you. Um, I also want to say that a bibliography of uh, Tony Hagen's writings are being prepared, is being prepared, and is to be published as part of the Martin Chautari bibliography series. Pratyush, do we know at what stage we are at in terms of publication? Of okay, so in the next month or so, we'll be able to provide this to the public, right? Great. So um, we'll notify by email about the bibliography. It's part of the series that Martin Chautari is putting out. So please stay in touch for that. With these, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, Deepak Gyawali who will be speaking today to us about Tony Hagen's life. Deepak is an old friend. He was one of the founding members of the Social Science Baha, so hosting you <coughs> today. Uh, many of you know him personally in any case and have read the introduction that's been provided. But I should just say that uh, he also has sought through his work to, uh, to be interdisciplinary. He uh, chairs the Interdisciplinary Analysts Company in Kathmandu, which has done a lot of evidence-based work in recent times, including surveys and other things. Um, he has served as a minister in uh, a government in Nepal in the recent uh, past, and has thoughtful uh, things to say about water resource governance. Um, I'm really delighted that he agreed, despite his busy travel schedule, to uh, join us um, and, uh, and celebrate the life and work of Tony Hagen. So Deepak, you've got about 40 minutes. I'll give you a warning, 10 minutes ahead. Thank you, thank you George. Uh, I'll first like to uh, begin by actually thanking Nanda and Pamela Shrestha for this endowment grant to the social science Baha. You know, traditionally in our part of the world, it used to be said that if you gave grants and gifts to Brahmins, you know, Dharma would be preserved. The modern version of this is that if you endow universities and social science Bahas, definitely knowledge gets transferred to the next generation and gets preserved in the process. So both of them are, we owe our thanks to them for doing this, uh, you know, uh, householders duty to Brahmins, I guess, modern Brahmins that we are here. Uh, I will first begin with a very personal uh, uh, reflection uh, about Tony Hagen, uh, discuss his writings. 
and then I'll focus on a few key critical areas that I too have been part of. There are many other areas that I have not been, so I can't speak too much about it. And then finally reflect about what it means and why much of it is still relevant today. <coughs> so many years after he's passed, it's over a decade and decade and a half that he's passed away. Uh, you know, my strangely, it turns out I had met Tony Hagen when I was in the third standard in St. Javier's Jowlik School. And Father Moran, our principal, uh, used to take us for some a walk, you know. And it happened to be that um, me, my cousin Prabhat Dixit, uh, several of us were uh, going and he took us to what is now the Sata office, but they were all, I think that's where they had their first office. Memory is vague. But I remember that, you know, we were small kids and Father Moran and what I later learned was Tony Hagen and a f couple of others that I don't remember or recognize were sitting on a around a table and there was a big uh, sort of you know uh, wheel of cheese there you know which we had never seen we didn't know what it was and these guys were all very excited about it don't ask me whether it was actually first cheese done here or brought I don't ask me but what they were doing was they had this funny kind of a screw and they used to screw that uh, barrel uh, pull out the the, 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 the screw and then open it up and there would be a s cylinder, a small cylinder of cheese which they broke and tasted and then they broke off that waxy part and plugged it back in. Which probably explains the holes in Swiss cheese, I guess, you know. But, uh, you know, they were all excited by it and uh, we were also asked to taste a bit and as far as I can remember, it tasted stank and tasted awful. But it's an acquired taste like beer, I guess, and I'm, you know, a great fan of, you know, blue cheese and all right now. So the blame goes to Tony Hagen and Father Moran, I guess. This is way back in 19, I think it was 1959, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the second one is, can you just go to the next uh, one slide? I don't have any slides, this is the only one. Uh, you know, in this picture, this is not Tony Hagen, okay? That's my father with the then Australian High Commissioner, uh, Ambassador, uh, in Birganj Railway Station. And my father's book, very clearly mentions, Tony Hagen's book doesn't mention my father's name, but uh, uh, he does mention that a government official came to receive him at uh, the Raksol Birganj border and saw them off to Amlekh Ganj. Now, my, my father then was in the, what is called, he had a double duty under the Rana, last days of the Rana rule, which doesn't happen very often. He was part of the Qatar Bahan Apiladda, which was in Kalaya. Uh, so he was a sort of like a district judge, I guess you would say. But at the same time, he was also under, uh, he was answerable to uh, Bijay Samsher, Mohan Samsher's son, who was de facto foreign minister of Nepal. So his duty was also what would today be called chief of protocol. So he was to receive all the foreign visitors there and send them off to Amlehgans from where they walked up the Chitlang Pass and came to Kathmandu. My father mentions in his book that the people he literally gave visas to on arrival at Birganj was Tony Hagen, Father Moran, uh, Professor Tucci, the Indologist from um, um, Italy, uh, uh, and, and uh, a few others eminent people like that is my father writes in his book. He didn't write in the book, but I remember him telling me that the first thing that Tony Hagen apparently asked, and it must have been an extremely wonderfully clear day, because on a really clear day from Birganj, you can see a bit of the mountain. So his first question was, what is that mountain called? Hmm? And like a true good Nepali, my father said, Himal, you know, which is what all of us say. That we, I remember. Go back to the other slide. You know. <coughs> okay. Now, my other uh, uh, interaction with him was uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, in this book, Ropo is in Nepal, we published with the help of Catherine and Monica, because Tony Hagen was already very weak by then, and the draft, his draft chapter had to go back and forth, back and forth, and he was already very weak, so Katrin and Monica had to help us put that together. <coughs> but it's possibly the last thing he wrote, okay? Uh, which is a comparison of the wrong turn in infrastructure development that Nepal took with bad roads versus trunk roads, good trunk roads, and ropeways. So that's a very critical chapter, and uh, it's also in his other uh, writings, okay? Incidentally, you know, uh, uh, when my father probably gave Tony Hagen his visa, I was not yet born, but I was born literally about six or five months after that, okay? 
And today, by the way, is my Nepali calendars. Uh, you know, we count uh, birthday by, you know, nine months in the womb is the first year. So today is my 70th birthday. And, uh, and these 70 years have been intertwined, in, intertwined with Tony Hagen and his work also. So this is a, a sort of an interesting uh, uh, coincidence. Now, I'll go through his list of publications. Uh, the list, as uh, George mentioned, is being published uh, the, the bibliography by Martin Chautari, uh, Social Science Baha and uh, the Tony Hagen Foundation are going to make sure, I'm told, that all his collection, uh, writings, uh, copies of them, including the ones in German, some of the more academic ones are in German, especially on geology and have not been yet, uh, I believe, translated. Uh, 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 there are many academic such pieces and they'll be brought together. So this is one of the uh, purpose of this gathering in this commemoration is also to make sure that that is available to Nepali scholars uh, in the future. Okay, uh, it's also to inspire the newer researchers, you know, uh, not to reinvent, you know, the bicycle, but to definitely improve and maybe redesign it. And much of that bicycle work has already been done. The the advantage today we have is that much of his Important works are already available in English. There are four pu publications that I will basically be talking about. Uh, and uh, uh, these are in English and they already tell you, uh, especially for, let's say, a non-geologist, uh, the very first publication, uh, Nepal, uh, as it was called, uh, in 1961 it was published, but revised in 1998 uh, by Himal Books, Deepak Thapa, who's not here. Uh, uh, you know, it's about the best guide to geology of Nepal even today. And uh, that is because Tony Hagen traveled 14,000 kilometers on foot all over Nepal, doing the first mapping uh, and geological studies of the Himalaya. Uh, he was invited by the Swiss Forward Mission, as it was called, and the Ranas, Mohan Samshir and all, uh, who were anxious. Uh, Sardar Bhimbadur Pandey was the one who organized all that uh, from the Nepali side, from the London Embassy. And he was selected to come here and uh, he had just begun, uh, he had got excited about the Himalayas even as a young boy <coughs> and uh, <coughs> came here. But uh, uh, in all that walking around and uh, mapping the Himalayas, uh, it was the first time it was done. And so most people would have, that would have already been a lifetime work uh, of amazing proportion, but he continued into other areas. So that is what is interesting. Now. Uh, 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 the, I'll talk about that uh, basically these separate issues uh, also later. But what is interesting about that book, Nepal, 1961, was it's the first major book that opened up Nepal or explained Nepal to the world. You know, so that's important. Also important is it was twice banned by India, ostensibly for a bad map of Kashmir as they saw it. But really, if you look at it right from his description of what happened in 1951, the extreme high handedness and interference of the Indian ambassador here, which is very nicely documented, you know. So again, this is very relevant because that continues. So these are these are issues that uh, I'll talk about more later. Uh, the, the, the second uh, book that I uh, find very interesting uh, and important is this building bridges to the third world and it was translated from the German and published in English in 1994. Uh, part one and two are of the period between 50 and 60 uh, in the Rana and post Rana interregnum period. And uh, this is where most of his field work is described, the field work in geology. But it's not ex only geology, but uh, it's also geography. So the land had to be mapped, not just the rocks on the land but the shape of the land and everything. So this was an, uh, a monumental piece of work in geography also at that time. And let us not remember, uh, let us not forget that geography is one of those few interdisciplinary disciplines, you know, that transcends the natural and the social sciences. And I guess this is why in the process he had to force himself to also go from looking at rocks to looking at people that live on the rocks, okay. The second, uh, the third part of the book is about from 1959 to 1962, and it's about the Tibetan refugees that he got involved with. Because that was the time that uh, uh, they started streaming into Nepal after the Chinese takeover. And uh, it's a very interesting set of ch 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 uh, writing there of what he had to do and what he did, which is still unique and has a tremendous implication for today's development. 
we'll talk slightly about that, you know. But uh, this whole idea of what rehabilitation after disaster means, what development really means, and uh, all that is accounted there. There's also a very interesting uh, and strange praise and criticism of King Mahendra at that time. Tony Hagen was a Swiss, true Swiss Democrat, and he always uh, you know, argued for democracy, so he did not like what King Mahendra had done in 1960 uh, with the young democracy then. But then he again sees that King Mahendra did take a very strong stand uh, in uh, the work that was being done for the Tibetan refugees against all Chinese pressures. So he, he sees that as an extremely bold, bold uh, and strong thing about uh, the king. Part four is about uh, development works and insights from 62 to 92. Now, between 62 and 72, he spent more time in Peru and Yemen and later in the Bangladesh uh, refugee crisis <coughs> uh, in the uh, Bangladesh War of Liberation, but did come to Nepal on and off in between and did some significant, still continued to do a lot of work with the uh, Tibetan uh, refugees and with development issues here in Nepal. But then after he retired from UNDP, uh, he uh, concentrated more on coming back to Nepal very frequently after that. You know. And uh, 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 the third book is uh, Decentralization and Development, the Role of Democratic Principles. And it's subtitled Some Comparisons Between Switzerland and Nepal in the Fields of Tourism, Hydropower and Infrastructure. Okay. It was published in 2012 posthumously. A lot of work done by Katrin here and Susanna von der Heide and others. And uh, uh, it's mostly stuff he had written but put together afterwards from his notes and few other things. Okay. What's interesting there is also the, the second chapter which is Rethinking Development. And much of Tony Hagen's views on development come from what I call towards eye science as opposed to eagle eye science. You know, looking at things from the perspectives, high perched uh, development agency, you know, London, Washington, D.C., wherever, or even Bern, and uh, actually seeing how things are in the, at, the, at the grassroots. And that's extremely important. In that chapter, he also talks about Nepal's leap. It used to be said that Nepal, in that period, that half uh, century, uh, literally had to leap from the 14th century to the 20th century. Okay. And it's an amazing period of change that he sort of documents, lives through, reflects on, and has things to say. Yeah. Uh, refugees, disaster relief, uh, the whole issue of large dams, the issue of poverty and what poverty eradication really should mean. And most important to me, and this is extremely important, uh, what honest development cooperation is all about. It's extremely important. That that's uh, we'll talk more about it. But uh, it's very important to today's debate as well. Uh, for instance, uh, on hu dams, which we'll talk about later, also uh, there's a chapter in a publication of ours, Water Nepal, the journal is called, with anthropologist and cultural theorist Mike Thompson, who's also given a lecture at the Social Science Baha, where he has a chapter called "Huge Dam and Tiny Incomes." Okay. And the same thing was taken up by the Nepali macroeconomist Prem Jung Thapa later, uh, discussing that issue. And uh, what is remarkable is how Tony Hagen's views on what large dams and tiny incomes mean. How tiny incomes cannot sustain these large dams socially, developmentally, forget financially. And what it does to development and the lives of people afterwards is amazingly uh, you know, similar. The third chapter is about democracy and the Swiss model. And he has a blistering critique. Now, there are democracies and there are democracies, all kinds of democracies, but we just chose what India automatically chose, was, which was the British Westminster model, and we immediately copied that and continue to live with it today. <coughs> but, uh, you know, Tony has a very blistering critique of that Westminster model there on several grounds. <coughs> One of the uh, uh, important points he makes is that for young democracies, Westminster model is not very suitable simply because the Westminster model demands a party culture that takes years and centuries, if not centuries, to grow. And if that party culture is not there, you start getting extremely unholy alliances between individuals and things, which does not lead to uh, 
stability and therefore good development. And he's also got some blistering critique about this whole thing about vote of no confidence, which is there in the Westminster model, but is not there in other democracies. They're, they have other ways of expressing no confidence. This vote of no confidence leads to tremendous horse trading and instability, which we saw in the 1790s of Nepal and continue to see also in recent times. Okay. Now, this is strangely, uh, uh, you know, parallels a, uh, a very nice interview I just saw the other day of Russian President Putin, who was asked this question by a student of international relations from Moscow State University, and his remark was almost exactly similar. Uh, he was asked, you know, he's reforming the Russian whatever system right now, as you must, as you must be knowing, and he was asked, you know, about this parliamentary method of uh, democracy and all. And Putin said very clearly, there are all kinds of democracies. The French model is different, the American model is different, the British model is different, okay? And he said, you know, that in Russia, now, with all the horrible things done by the Communist Party, you know, uh, he said, you know, th there are no parties in Russia that are old enough with old enough culture to sustain a Westminster model. You know? And so this is also interesting that this debate now, <coughs> who's right, who's wrong is a different issue. But this debate about governance is something that we really have to, again, go back to, it looks like, okay, here in Nepal. In chapter 4, uh, it talks about um, the benefits of constitutional monarchy. Now, this is another very debatable chapter, okay. Uh, but he, his argument is, despite his criticism of King Mahendra and subsequent, you know, uh, praise for the uh, manner in which he managed to survive between two competing regional powers, his argument is that this is... Uh, for a country like Nepal, perhaps uh, m uh, a means of providing stability within a context of regional rivalry. And w at what that means to us today, now we've got, we become a republic, but then where is that search for st uh, re uh, uh, that preservation of stability in our governance structure is something that again is part of a debate that will not uh, go away. Uh, in, in the fifth chapter, it's about tourism, Swiss versus Nepali, and uh, where he talks about the Swiss model of tourism development, which was grassroots up, <coughs> versus the Nepali model, which has been top down, and which is where I have a bit of a disagreement uh, uh, with uh, Tony Hagen on this, because my view is that compared to other sectors in Nepal, like hydropower or whatever, tourism still has been a sector developed mostly in Nepal in the 70s by the private sector. Which is why there is a culture of tourism, hospitality and management in Nepal uh, that you do not find in India or any other place like that. You go to a remote village in Nepal and they probably know how to deal with tourists and guess much, much better than you find in some of the best five-star hotels in India. Uh, which is no wonder that most Nepalis who migrate out, you find them in restaurants and uh, hotels and everywhere else. Okay? But that's because of this culture. So I'm not quite sure that Nepal was top down. In fact, where Nepal has attempted tourism top down as with creation of this useless, in my view, sorry for a strong word, this uh, tourism development board or something like that, it's, a, it's just a taxing mechanism and really hasn't done much to contribute to uh, real tourism development, which the private sector has done a much better job in Nepal. Sixth chapter is of hydropower, we'll talk about that. Seventh chapter is about transportation and alternatives. And the eighth chapter is about rural poverty. So this book already gives a very comprehensive uh, sort of a picture of all the uh, summary of his uh, work and insights. The fourth and final book recently came out uh, last year, The Photos of Kathmandu Valley, 1950-1960. Katrin is here and uh, they've managed to do a great bit of editing. Uh, uh, Vajra Books brought it out. And, uh, it is important not just as a piece of history of photographs and things like that. It is useful in analysis of the process of change. Okay, Subikas versus Kubikas or apt versus mal development. Because development is such a loaded word that you know, anything proposed in the name of development, if it's bad and you oppose it, you're accused of being anti-developmental. And that has not led to a healthy discourse in Nepal. You know, development can be both good or bad developments. We would, I would personally support good development and really oppose bad development. But that, again, a parliamentary democracy that doesn't allow space for these dissenting voices to come. As the examples of, you know, from Arun three to needs God to just about everything shows us today. Okay. Now, if we are to reverse or to correct mal to app development, 
this collection of photographs is extremely useful as a reference for such planning. Uh, I remember a famous statement by an Israeli uh, president at the funeral of John Kennedy where he defined what tragedy was and that's the best definition I've ever heard. He said tragedy at Kennedy, Kennedy's funeral who was killed so young, assassinated, he said tragedy is the difference between what is and what might have been. So when you see this book on Kathmandu Valley's pictures by Tony Hagen, 1950-1960, you see the tragedy of Kathmandu, which is the difference between what is and what might have been instead of the mess and the great slumification that we have uh, transformed this valley into. Now, I'll go to his uh, journal and today's relevance in, in quickly in four key areas. The first is geology and geography. Okay. Now, I am only a geologist to the extent as a hydropower engineer. I had to do some geology to figure out what dam foundations would be like. And we have Govinda Sharma Pokhrel, my colleague here, who is Nepal's first hydrogeologist. And he, during question, I'm sure can answer a lot of other questions. But uh, 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 this, at least for people like us who are not geologists per se, the first and the last of those two, uh, the, the four publications I mentioned, give a really good account already. Now, what is significant about his work in geology, and I summarize brutally, is uh, this is the first time mapping had never been done before, and it's surprisingly valid even till today. Okay. Uh, the second is that is he is influenced by the Swiss school of geology of those days, and there's a big debate. This is the time of the continental drift and Wagner and a whole lot of geologists. That debate is still on today, but we've got much better knowledge today with all the fancy technologies of iridium, you know, uh, tracing and all that, okay? The upthrust of the Himalaya was a debatable point at that. And the Swiss school of thought now, uh, was a marginal school of thought at that point, but turned out to be extremely important. And Tony Hagen's application of that to understanding Nepal's geology uh, is the concept of Nape. I'm pronouncing it correctly? Nape. This is as the upthrust occurs. Now, most schools just say yeah, the Himalayas upthrust and there is just erosion, you know. Yeah, there is erosion. It's much more than that because this upthrust actually, you know, it's so high already that you get the material just flowing over and eroding much faster after that than would have otherwise. Now this has tremendous implications for the work, at least for in my area of hydropower. You know, what this is important and Tony Hagen's kind of geology is important is, we have a tendency to think of Nepal and hydropower as just water. No, those gorges that you see the river going down is, uh, is, is a conveyor belt for both water and matter. And huge amounts of matter, let me tell you. And it has implications for how we build dams, whether we build them, for how long should we uh, plan on having them pay, pay back their period. Because Kosi alone produces 100 million cubic, uh, 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 cubic meters of silt every year. You impound a dam, you don't impound just the water, you impound all that eroding nappe stuff. You know, That's the first uh, issue of significance to us today. And our pub public discourse on hydropower and energy has completely ignored this much to the grief of many of the private developers even today uh, there are significant private developers in Nepal it's equal their development is equal to that of the Nepal electricity authority but then they're realizing that you know all the sediment and all that is just throwing their economics out of the window you know and the banks uh, this year my some of the banks might go belly up because of that yeah, it's a very dangerous thing it's very relevant till today the overexposed banks okay the second important thing about the geology is you know Tony Hagen's you know he was brought because the Ranas wanted to find out if there was lots of minerals and they could make money well everybody wants to be a Sheikh of Arabi uh, <laughs> he said very bluntly the geology already tells you this Nape formation and its erosion you know really means forget petroleum there is no petroleum in Nepal the geology didn't allow the organic matters to be you know come in large amounts and get compressed and massively uh, to get their, you know, the good stuff oozed out into oil and tar and everything like that. And whatever must have been done, uh, we, uh, have compressed and produced, must have evaporated in geological time way long ago. So there is no petroleum. If there is, it is be below the Siwaliks. And we know that there is some gas in Bangladesh. Okay, that's true. <coughs> the second is that uh, tied to this is the fact that there are no significant mineral deposits. It's the nature of the geology. It doesn't allow significant amount. There are pockets 
with tremendous amount of uh, concentrated iron ore or zinc or uh, magnesite or something in Karidunga and all that, but not in amounts that would really allow uh, for this kind of, uh, you know, Arabs exporting oil and becoming sheikhs of Arabi. Okay. Now, what this means, that the implication of this is extremely important. He talks about the town of Tosi, and I had the the good fortune to actually do my study with another Swiss group in France of Zurich on rural urban interlinkage and I stayed in Those. Now Those is the place that was the mechanical engineering workshop of the, during the Rana days and I had read that the 1924 treaty with the British stopped arms production there but it turns out it was much more than arms production. You know, it was actually metallurgical production of many other things including bridges in Baglung and a few other things that came from there. Now, all that went out of the window. Why? Because of this extreme trade liberalization. Now, that's extremely significant in the sort of thing that Tony Hagen writes about. It's important. It's not enough to, economic enough to mine and export to Japan or China or something. But, and this is the point Tony makes, is that it is important for local handicraft. If we did it properly, it's very rich concentration of good ore, which we could produce for our own handicraft. But we threw all that out of the window and much of our handicraft now comes from Kashmir and China, okay, marketed as Nepali. Now this is extremely uh, important. Also important is Swiss, like us, because of that Nape formation, also have no oil. But the Swiss have been smart enough, you know, they've got the OPEC headquarters there. So would you want the oil and have uh, the resource curse or would you want to have the OPEC headquarters in your country and all their money and bank balance maintained in your own country? Now this is a serious development question. Okay, the um, other uh, topic is disaster relief and poverty. Now, this is something that Tony Hagen got into as he began to work with the Tibetan refugees. Now, what is really significant there in his work is the idea that don't give people fish, give them the, uh, teach them how to fish. So, his success, his innovation, because of his 14,000 uh, kilometer walking across Nepal showed him what people were, how they live, what the land is, what it supports. He was able to introduce this carpet manufacturing among the Tibetan refugees so that they could earn something respectfully and not live on handouts. Okay? Now, this also led to the growth of ancillary industries, wool production in uh, Bajang and all sorts of funny places, you know. And uh, metallic paints for Thanka and other painting also that we had here. All that came about with <coughs> this kind of uh, an approach to disaster. That it was not, you know, you just don't go to the people struck with disaster and say here are powder milk and here is this and throw it. You should make sure that their livelihood comes back, that their respect comes back, that they're able to get a livelihood that earn, allows them to earn money and not beg for food, okay? Now this was the uh, critical innovation. He also talks about uh, this income generation with an organization that I was the founding chair of it way back in 92, the Rural Self-Reliance Development Center or what is called uh, Gramit Swabalaman Bikas Kendra uh, with Devan Raj Pandey in Jadeva and all where we started exactly along those similar lines of income generation. Okay? So it was not microcredit, the word hadn't been invented then. It was actually organizing the rural poor to be able to sell their skills, the Kamis of Jadeva who knew how to make uh, iron equipment for agriculture, uh, we were able to get them to use copper plates to make, them make uh, uh, you know, these utensils for puja, which sold for a much better price uh, in, in Tansen Bazaar and helped them get out of poverty. Okay? So this is exactly the kind of philosophy that Tony Hagen was uh, advocating and which we sort of internalized. <coughs> the same was true with the green roads of Dharing and Palpa, okay? which was actually not using not efficiency, using bulldozers and things to get work done fast, but getting people to actually, you know, earn an income there. So our work in RSDC with the, with the Green Roads was also similar to that of actually organizing the rural poor to earn a better wage by themselves. You know, the Thekadar would have given them, the contractor would have given them 25 rupees a day. We were able to make sure that the 125 rupees per day labor price went to them. There's a heck of a difference. Okay. So this is the thing. In... Um, uh, the final important thing is uh, uh, the very critical thing that Tony Hagen has to say about development agencies, especially his own burn-based uh, 
development bureaucrats. He has extremely critical things to say. I, you know, I reread it before this lecture, and it's amazing. Uh, our book came out in 2017, Aid, Technology, and Development, The Lessons from Nepal from Routledge, where one of the statements we make in the conclusion is that aid agencies and their permanent senior staff themselves are big problems. And I was so pleased to reread Tony Hagen to find out that that's exactly what he says. His carpet, uh, uh, refugees carpet thing was almost sabotaged, you know, uh, uh, by the aid agencies. And there's a very interesting discussion about how it happened that it was not Nepalese or Chinese or King Mahendra or anybody like that. It was the Swiss bureaucrats. Okay. So this is uh, extremely interesting. And as a research question to some of the younger folks, you know, a paper on the difference between how Nepal handled the Tibetan refugees by, the, by this method versus how we handle the Bhutanese Lotsampa, you know, is a paper still waiting to be written, a comparison. It's worth looking back to see, have we learned anything? Okay. Hydropower. Hmm. Now, this is an area where I could go on and on, but I'll try to make, you know, <coughs> put breaks on myself. This is one area where the Swiss really can advise Nepal. And interesting advice has been given. Strangely, <coughs> strangely, what Tony Hagen has to say about how hydropower should be developed is exactly how another, you know, uh, interesting Western expert came to Nepal, spent over 40 years here uh, working, Odd Hofton from Norway. Yeah. And a book is coming out by Mark Lefty, uh, I hope soon, uh, on Odd Hofton. And the whole challenging paradigm of development. <coughs> Both have a similar paradigm of development as some of us who are activists in this field do. No. Uh, let's remember that Kule Khani was originally identified by, Kule, uh, by Tony Hagen during his work, but he identified it as an electricity and transport project, a multipurpose project for both things. Unfortunately, it again got hijacked by aid agencies and was built as a single purpose hydropower only project. And now we are revisiting that to find out that 50 tons of fish could be produced in the reservoir as villagers do. We're finding out that there are farm managed irrigation systems in Rapti Basin that are actually using that dry season water. The industrial town of Hetaura, it turns out, could really use that dry season water for industrial and domestic purposes that uh, that dry area that's a dry dune valley uh, cannot otherwise have water now instead of designing it as this multi-purpose project we chose it as a hydropower project and you know for uh, well, you know we lost a lot of the other benefits by unplanned development um, important in both what tony hagen says what odd often says is the necessity to focus in hydropower development on capacity, Nepali capacity development versus aid agency efficiency and outside contractors, consultants siphoning off the profits. Kulekhani is a great example. When the 90, in 1993, when the cloud burst occurred and we uh, lost Kulekhani because the pen stock got washed away, uh, many stations like, well, Landi Khola, a few others built by Nepalis, by the or often Tony Hagen method, uh, were rehabilitated. Okay. Kulekhani, we found out we did not even know the thickness of the steel of the penstock pipe. And we had to bring back that those Japanese experts, you know, and we had to get back get money from the Japanese at you know tremendous amount of uh, cost uh, to do that rehabilitation. So the question in development from what Tony Hagen writes comes back to this question of resilience in development. Disasters will always happen. There will be cloud bursts. There will be floods. Bridges will be washed off. Roads will be washed off. Hydropower dams will collapse. <coughs> Is there the capacity to rebuild it without having to go again and find these expensive consultants abroad to do it? Okay. Now, Tony Hagen has a lot to write on Arun 3 because he was helping us in that campaign. Now, a word I have to give because there's so much misunderstanding because of political party misinformation all political parties i should say practically you know arun 3 battle was not about gana and putali or you know rhinoceros and butterflies you know give us credit for heaven's sake us people like us we know there is no rhinoceros in sankwasawa damn it <laughs> we're not talking about that arun 3 was about expense project fi five times more expensive than what satluj is going to be building right now 20 years later at and that is what we were opposed to $5,400 per kilowatt 
when projects like that should be built at under 1000. So that was what the fight was about. Okay, And Tony Hagen was a great help in all that and he was helping us with all this. And uh, the cancellation of Arun 3 was a benefit to Nepal because we have got, and this is something that's not popularly known, we got a third more electricity at half the cost, half the time after Arun 3 got cancelled. I rest my case. We don't need to go much further. Hari Bairagi Dahal, the late Hari Bairagi, passed away tragically with a heart attack, uh, managed to build in the same Arun Valley a 4 megawatt plant at $1,200 per kilowatt instead of the World Bank's 5400 At the time when there was no road in Sakwa Sabha, he managed to build it at that cost. You know, it is possible, it turns out, but this is what the fight was. Now, one, and so Tony's points and this whole idea of the resilience not being there in that model of development stands even today. Okay. With hindsight, I have one difference with Tony Hagen, I should mention this, you know, he, uh, after that, uh, the ADB money was put into Kali Gandaki, and some of us were still upset that the same model of development was being followed. The World Bank then happily was going to put the money into a power development fund to be available to the smaller developers. It still has not happened 25 years later, which means, you know, it calls into question that should World Bank even be in development, that they can't even make a fund. Okay, whereas ADB was building Kaliganda, okay, and we were sort of, you know, the high cost issue was still there. But Tony gave us advice, politically good advice at that point. He said, listen, you can't be seen as opposing everything. You had a success with Arun 3. So let the, and you all yourself said Kaliganda, you know, a few others projects are the alternatives that are cheaper. Well, you should let that happen. So we rested. And that, I think, with hindsight was a mistake. Because while Tony was right that we shouldn't be seen as opposing everything, and we are not, we are opposed to bad development, not good development. Uh, uh, the mistake we made with hindsight now, you know, over 20 years later, is that, you know, the political economy of this rent seeking and gouging profit through uh, s construction contracts is stronger now than ever. It was there in Kaligandaki. Kaligandaki was built at half the cost of Arun 3. Good. But then still two times more expensive than it should have been. <coughs> and that continues today, that Nepali consumers are really paying unnecessarily for ex excessively high cost electricity. It didn't have to. We needed cheap and reliable electricity to make our industry competitive. And that has not yet happened. Okay. And uh, this is what uh, Nicholas Hildyar, the editor of The Ecologist, when reflecting back on Arun 3 and everything, calls the grand licensed larceny of these privatized quote-unquote infrastructure projects. Okay. Now, if you think what Tony Hagen has said in hydropower development in his work is not relevant today, let me tell you one thing. Go back to looking at the MCA, MCC debate today and think again. There are issues of development that are there right now. Let me go to transport. I'm about to finish. Okay. And this is an area where we did work with Tony um, uh, also. Uh, we uh, managed to convince the British ambassador to build the Barpak uh, ropeway. And Tony helped us bring the Swiss Army uh, ropeway, goods carrying ropeway, for that purpose. It's all described in the book, in the chapter by Birbadur Ghale and Bola Shrestha, two different chapters. It's worth reading. You know, and this is, as I said, possibly the last chapter he wrote comparing Swiss development pathway. Now, see, it's not to say don't build roads. We need trunk, good all-weather trunk roads that can be maintained, okay? But you do not need, uh, you know, a road to every house in every hamlet hilltop here, okay? We were doing some research as part of our uh, project right now on water-induced disaster. And we were in Palung and in several other areas. And I was shocked to find out that most of the Gaupalika, the village the chair that won the elections, most of them, uh, their election manifesto said, and this is across Nepal and it's a frightening thought when you think of it, okay? Their election manifesto of all the winners, okay, mostly from UML, uh, was, we will make sure there is a road to within three minutes walking from your house. Think what kind of a Nepal would have to be there to have a road within three minutes walking. I live right here in Patandoka. To get to the road, it takes me more than five minutes, okay? 
Kanak, it takes you more than that to also to get your road, okay? But to have road for every Nepali house in every hamlet, every hilltop, uh, three minutes from walking, we are headed for this kind of dozer atanka disaster. I think Tony foresaw that as a geologist much before we did, you know. And today, much of the flooding in the Tarai is actually coming from the fact that these kind of roads are bringing down silt and sedimentation, raising the bed le level of uh, Tarai rivers and the water spilling over. <coughs> this, this, the consequence of this is, okay. Why are rope is better, you know, goods carrying? They are three times cheaper to build than an equivalent green road. Green road, not the big highways. Eight times quicker to install. They can be installed in one season. Green roads take at least four years to sort of slowly widen. They can be dismantled and built elsewhere, avoiding technological lockedness. Ecological damage footprint is negligible compared to roads. This is mountain-friendly technology. And it's not a new technology. Chandra Samshar brought it almost exactly 100 years ago. And USAID helped build one in uh, rebuild that in 1964, okay, around that time. It's two times more energy efficient. It consumes only 34 megajoules per ton of energy compared to 53 megajoules per ton for trucks. And trucks consume petroleum. This 34 megajoules per ton, half the energy cost, comes from Nepali hydropower. Now, so it is climate friendly, mountain friendly, but this is a technology that's not being that's not being pushed at all. And this is where the development debate really becomes uh, very significant. This is where Tony Hagen's writings also point to this uncomfortable lock, technological lockedness and the political economy that uh, shuts off alternative possibilities. And this is the most dangerous thing. So I, I'll conclude by you know, reflecting on some of his synthesizing experience and insights. <coughs> Looking back at his journey, and as George mentioned, and that's indeed the journey of many of us who started out as specialists in one area, and then who had to make uh, or had to get involved with other aspects and disciplines along our way, you know, uh, my, uh, my electricity transmission line building in Donaldura Dun actually converted me into an anthropologist. And uh, <laughs> this is recounted in the book. You know. It's very interesting to see that uh, much of your technical work and then the social reality there, you know, these are things that hit you as, as an expert. And when you're working in the field, you find out, you better start reflecting on them. So this is where Tony Hagen becomes extremely, not just important, it's also very heartening, you know, and moments of disappointment because you find out, you know, what's my discipline? What the hell am I doing, you know? And then you say, wait a minute, you know, there are others who've gone through this and come out better at the end of that exercise. The narrow expertise, highly skilled who work, slowly moves, you know, towards opening up the unstated background behind such work, its context, its surprises, and relevance. Now, this is also another important thing that comes out and reflects in many of our works also. Uh, when he moved from rocks to people living on those rocks, you know, he had to also bring in a whole lot of other disciplines that people living on rocks have to encounter. So obviously, there was the first thing was agriculture. As you move from geology and geography, it's agriculture and how are people living there. It's history, it's ethnicity and demography. He writes about all these things. It's rituals, language, culture. It's the challenges of global change, <coughs> the stress of global change. It's the, again, the problems and the systems, you know, system of governance and their shortcomings, hence politics. You know. All these things come together. And as one moves from the harder to the softer sciences, one moves from what I would call concentrated uncertainty to diffuse uncertainty, you know, from things only expert scientists can talk about to things ev everyone is an expert on, things is an expert on, and in truth should be an expert on. Every, you know, informed and reflective citizen is an expert on politics, is an expert on development, because that is their lived experience. So there is nothing to be ashamed of to say that, oh, this is, this is, as you get into these developmental issues, everyone is an expert. The issue there is, <coughs> do we have an adequate platform for democratic discourse and debate about it? And this is where much of Tony Hagen's work comes. 
I mean, we differ. We don't have to agree with Tony Hagen everything. I already mentioned Kali Gandaki. I mentioned his assessment of monarchs, which I'm sure a lot of people will not agree with, you know. But what is important for the re and relevant for the upcoming generation of Nepali scholars is Tony Hagen's background work and the manner in which he synthesizes and comes to the conclusions that he does. This is a great place to start new research in one's related field. You know. Now, I close with a remark Ashish Nandi made here, the Indian uh, social scientist, uh, I mean social scientist here in Kathmandu. He mentioned in one of the debates we were having that new knowledge production in South Asia, he was talking about bitterly about India. He said new knowledge production has moved outside of the university walls and is happening outside of the university walls, mostly in social movements, mostly in you know, good NGOs and others. Okay? Now, Tony Hagen, I conclude, is one of such foci of new knowledge production. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Um, finished exactly on time. Thanks very much for that. Um, um, but you've set the stage for question and answer now. We have at least 30 minutes of that. Uh, available. We'll take them in batches of four or five, please, if you don't mind. Could I see uh, my hand or two to get things started off uh, in terms of questions to Deepak? Please. If you could identify yourself, that would be helpful to others. And my question is about uh, the advantages of ropeways in the mountain area. I come from Teratham and uh, uh, I am not read the book ropeways in Nepal, but I've heard that it has discussed a lot about the advantages. My specific question is, are there some case examples in the villages where ropeways have been, I mean, some kind of success story where the ropeways have been used and people are benefiting from it? Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, back. Please. Hello. Thank you. I'm Nishnu Thing. I'm pointed on the point the Deepak Gheoli strongly disagreed with the approach of this Tony Egan's top-down or uh, down-up approach while he was uh, talking about the tourism sector in Nepal. And uh, Deepak Gheoli strongly praised uh, private sector's uh, role in tourism. And uh, what I am seeing now in the Nepal is, uh, yeah, private sector is doing well in Nepal in the tourism sector. But uh, even the our community also working on tourism, we have a collective culture and uh, so that uh, uh, in the uh, five star hotel so you can find out many cultural shows and attires are being performed there from the community but the private sector is doing lot benefit from that and uh, community is not getting anything and uh, uh, there is much contribution in the tourism by community and uh, what uh, the Tony Hagen's approach and your disagreement is this is relevant or uh, how do you justify it? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, I should say if you feel more comfortable speaking in your own, uh, I mean in Nepali, that would be fine too. I'll try to interpret for you. Kanak, please. <laughs> Just a conversation I had with Professor Hagen as well. I'd like to repeat right here. The, uh, the Ghatu Nach of the Gurung and the Magar, uh, we discussed the point that it should never be brought down to the dance bars and uh, the dance restaurants of Pokhara or Walling or Kathmandu because the Ghatu Nach should be, should be danced as appropriate according to culture, according to the, uh, the lunar calendar in the villages where they are. So the tourists go looking for it. And I think what Deepak Gewali was mentioning was that probably trekking tourism has a links to the grassroots that many other tourism industries in the world may not have. But this is just something that I 
took off from uh, uh, suggestion or uh, question but the point I wanted to make uh, separately was simply that um, the discussion by uh, Deepak Gewaliji uh, was mostly focused on infrastructure development um, a little bit of uh, cultural issues um, I thought there was uh, one element of Tony Hagen that came to light uh, towards the latter part of his career and involvement in Nepal um, in the socio-political sphere. After the uh, Jana Andolan of 2006, uh, Basar Trisarthi, uh, Dr. Novel Kishore Rai and I were at his village in Leinzer Haide and it was he who told us it is now time for Nepal to start focusing on inclusive development. And the term inclusive development obviously was there beforehand in other spheres, but that is where he emphasized this point to us so that when we came back with the social science Baha, Hamile Zaini Avada Hari Sarvaji Yehunansha, Hamile inclusion like kun bhasa ma prayo garni vanda kari, pheri pani Hamile coin gara hai nao, aruli pani gara ka holan, tara sama beshi ta vanni sabda Hamile Zaini Avada conference gara ra, tiyo conference ma, because of Professor Hagen's input on inclusion, that is how, at least from our side, we managed to slip it in. So I'd like to recall uh, Dr. Naval Kishorai and Hari Sharma Ji also were here, just to make this point. Thank you, Gana. Anyone else for the last question in this batch? Please, Dr. Bhattarai. Namaskar, I'm Durga Prashad Bhattarai. I belong to the uh, Nepalese bureaucracy before, so uh, I'll address you as Minister Gimali, sir. Because once a minister, always minister, unless fallen <laughs> drastically from grace. So <laughs> uh, wonderful. It was a very lucid, very powerful and animated presentation. I really commend that. And um, there were too many dots. You connected so many. Uh, and uh, it's very uh, insightful on many occasions. I, uh, I can't say it's a question, but perhaps a suggestion, a comment, or uh, partly question also. You mentioned about 14,000 plus kilometers uh, he traveled, Tony Hagen traveled. Uh, it's Tony Hagen Trail ac across Nepal. I don't know how many people have uh, retraced that trail. Uh, many people were trained by him, worked with him, uh, and did wonderful work afterwards. Uh, and as you said, moving from one discipline to multidisciplinary approach, would there be any scope of making use, retracing, um, retracing and making use of Tony Hagen Trail uh, for instruction in multidisciplinary approach, uh, not only limited to Nepal, but an example uh, for the world, combining everything you said? Thank you. Thank you. Um, please, uh, others think about questions you want to ask Deepak. I'll let him start with these first four. Thank you. Okay, on ropeways, uh, you can download that from the Nepal Water Conservation Foundation website. Uh, we put the whole book in PDF and put it up there. Nobody makes money in Nepal from selling books anyway, so what's the point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we said, heck, we know there. Take it, okay? So, uh, uh, the two, the success stories, that two big success stories that we do have, we have failures and successes there. The failure is Nepal Ropeways, and the reason it failed is the sabotage by the earliest truck owners, and this was, Tony Hagen also mentions this in his book, uh, by the truck owners when the Tribhuvan Highway was opened up, okay? And uh, the political economy of technology is uh, not very well su studied subject, but it's an extremely interesting one because you know uh, people who are carriers of social carriers of technology are often not Mother Teresas out there to make money. Uh, the two success examples that we have, the failure is that one. The two success examples are Bhattedana and Barpak and the Khimti construction ropeway. Khimti project was able to finish its project in time because they quickly found out that, you know, waiting for forest department to give them permission to build a road to the uh, access tunnels and all was going to take forever. You know, if you are a government department, you can force the forest department to do certain things. You are a private sector, you are at their mercy. So they decided to do it by a ropeway and that really helped. 
<coughs> in fact, the <coughs> figures that I used about how rope way is cheaper in transport uh, partly comes from our uh, you know, analysis of the Khimti cost. So that's half, you know, half the energy it consumes compared to uh, uh, trucks, not counting the cost of transporting the diesel, okay, by the way. So this is important. Now, more important, I think, in answering this question is the political economy of road versus uh, uh, ropeways. As Bhattarana and Barpak both showed, and both had their share of tragedies. In Barpak, the lower station got washed off because of a massive un unprecedented flood. And also, misuse, you know, Birbadur Ghale, I still remember, you know, the entrepreneur who we helped build that. Uh, that was meant to be a goods carrying ropeway and not a people carrying ropeway. People carrying ropeway, the engineering of it has to be seven times in safety factor compared to a goods carrying ropeway and hence commensurately more expensive, okay. Now, what happened was that bar Rangrung to Barpa climb is five hours with a load, okay. Now, this took 15 minutes. So what happened was, well, willy-nilly people started going on this, you know. They were not supposed to. So when I told this to Birbadur Gale, he said, Ke garne, ke garne. I said, why don't you do it by weight? And he said, the Western tourists were the worst, you know. They were the ones who were using it most, okay. So I said, do it by weight. You know, Western tourists are bigger and fatter and you earn more weight, so no. by per kilogram, you know, or whatever, okay. He said, I did that, but they still pay for it, you know, okay. Then the answer was given by an old lady to me in uh, Gorkha. <coughs> when we mentioned this, she looked at me and said, Sir, have you ever been on this twin, you know, that girling? I said, No, I, do, I wouldn't dare to, you know. Isn't this safer than the girling? I had no answer. You know, obviously, a Swiss Army ropeway <laughs> carrying, you know, 150 kilograms is far safer than a girling where you have to, you know, pull yourself across. So, technology has to be seen in terms of this. Now, but the political economy I want to drive at is this. When the Bhattarana Milkway was built, the transport was controlled by the villagers, the milk cooperative. When the road came, the transport cost was controlled by the truck owner. So suddenly now you saw that, uh, you know, in Marxist terms, where the exploitation shifted to. Okay. Now this has been the problem of roads in Nepal. Yeah, everybody wants a road and development, forgetting the fact that, you know, it's, you know roads don't carry, you know, milk and goods, trucks do. And who owns the truck? Not every villager can own a truck. Okay. So this is where the political economy completely shifted and led to the impoverishment of Nepal through a wrong choice of technology. <laughs> That's what we're trying to drive at. Okay. Now, uh, Kanak and uh, your, your question on tourism and uh, uh, the, you know, the private sector's role, it is a complicated role. Okay. It's uh, dynamic. It's constantly changing. Uh, initially, I, my view of the uh, tourism sector, private sector was they were doing quite well. Then the big hotels started, I call it cannibalizing culture, you know, bringing it out of their context and, you know, getting just, you know, to tourists to look at and take pictures while, you know, you know, drinking and doing something else. So completely cut off from culture, which is also what Tony Hagen was driving at in much of his writing, you can see in the Swiss example, where he said people went to those places. Those places did not come to a five-star hotel. Okay, there's a huge difference. Okay, now on the positive side, let's look at Dwarika Hotel uh, and how it was able to preserve a kind of uh, old traditional Newar architecture. And now today we use this dancey bricks all over and we do all kinds of things with it. But that was not there until Dwarika Hotel came up, Dwarika Das Resta's imagination. And uh, that would not have been possible if it was not for tourism <coughs> because he was packing all those carved wood in his uh, you know farm literally in Batisputali and as he told me he said you know there's so much of it he didn't know what to do with it so he took all the wooden pieces and built a hotel around it that's exactly what happened but then it was sustained even the brick making had to be a separate brick factory set up he even had to train gubajus you know to uh, the carvers with gubajus to figure out what each element of the carving meant so you see that tourism did have done properly, uh, 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 a sort of an element in actually, f you know, preserving culture. But of course, there are plenty of good e bad examples of uh, it being can uh, in a cannibalistic mode. And um, finally, on um, uh, uh, 
uh, on the Tony Hagen Trail, I think it's a really good idea. And I'd like to ask, we have the chairman of the Tony Hagen Foundation, Professor Jha, sitting right here. What I would ask is that two areas we look into, you know. One from the tourism side, which are some of these areas where he walked, which still are pretty pristine tourism areas. And second is, I'm going to ask Govinda, uh, you're a member of the Geological Society, aren't you? Yeah. You know, students, geology students have to go all the time doing, you know, their stuff, you know, you know, hit rock hammers and doing things. Huh? Uh, can Tony Hagen Foundation work in these two areas with the Geological Society on one side and with the trail homestay kind of people to and call it Tony Hagen Trail, you know, for geologists and for uh, uh, others and uh, develop them and see and there must be some areas that we can at least hope will be preserved and will not be under the dozer atanka you know so this is where i would suggest <coughs> please, yeah please. Yeah. On this, on the i would like to add something on tony hagen trail uh, actually the entire length of Nepal is about 1,000 1, 1, 1, kilometers, and you don't get 14,000 kilometers, you know, in one go. So it must be back and forth, you know, up and up and down. But Please I'm introduce I'm yourself. To, I'm going the Pokhara. Uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to start with that with the trail, probably it it makes a lot of sense to start the trail somewhere in the east of Nepal and go all the way to the west with north-south uh, sections, you know, crossing, I mean, uh, in different areas. Maybe he has like <coughs> tens of those north-south trails that cross the east-west. And those east-west trails must be not one or not two, maybe tens of them. So probably find the right one, the right east-west to start with and then find out the north south ones so that you know i mean i mean step by step keep on increasing those numbers i mean looking at the feasibility looking at different things so that it is interesting for the foundation as well as for the people who do the rear, rear travels in those trails thank you could you pass the mic to catherine please thank you and then I have some remarks about Tony Hagen Trail. I mean, I know very well his, his diary, what he wrote about the trails he found in the 1950s. And uh, I myself, I did a lot of trekking since 1975. And what I found already the, at that time, the trails were much better than what my father found. So that there is, you cannot compare it. And uh, the other thing, what kind of trail do you want to make? I mean, you cannot make a big trail. Nepal is a very big country. I mean, in Switzerland, maybe you can, you can uh, cross with, uh, walk within maybe 10 hours walking. You can start from lowlands up to the mountains and you s see all the different uh, ve uh, zones of veg vegetation. Here, this is too far. And uh, the other thing, what I have seen, we, our foundation, not the Tony Hagen Foundation in Nepal, but the Tony Hagen Foundation in Switzerland, we supported once, there was a Swiss organization, Via Astoria. They wanted to, to um, research about the pilgrim trail up to, um, you know, from Humla to, uh, to uh, Manzarawar and from from more down, uh, they stopped because you cannot preserve any trail. I have seen this now so many times. So nice trails. Now they are building everywhere roads, and the trails are are uh, disturbed. You cannot walk anymore on the trails. When I have been last year, also in the Humla area, okay, I had to walk on the street. The street was, uh, the road was more like a trail and not really as a road, but the old nice trails with the stone stairs, you cannot find anymore. So, in my opinion, I also thought, we, were sp we spoke many years ago, one should make, uh, repair the old trading route from Kapmandu to Pokhara. You cannot, it's gone, it's by the roads, you, it's not anymore possible. 
So for me, there is no sense to make a Tunihagen trail. Thank you. Professor Ja, please. Yeah. yeah, it was a very enlightening talk by Minister, Honorable Minister Deepak Gawali. <laughs> <laughs> minister is always minister, okay. as Mr. Patra has mentioned. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, I am Pramod Kumar Jha, uh, Chairman of Tony Hagen Foundation, Nepal. I am not a geologist. I am a plant scientist or ecologist. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Tony Hagen first time in 1993 and after. since then I was in regular touch with him. Uh, as far as geology is concerned, one of my good friends, uh, geologist, Professor Meg Rajdital told me uh, that uh, Dr. Tony Hagen's geological work was, you see, he did a wonderful geological work in 1950 to the, uh, 1960, but there was some politics or criticism or something wrong happened and uh, Nepal was dominated by the Japanese uh, geologist and because of that his work was not highlighted or we can say that was sidelined. It remained sidelined for uh, roughly about three decades. And later on, it was realized that his work was correct, absolutely correct, and the Japanese work was not. So now, so it was on the wrong track. Okay? So now after 1990 in Nepal, the geologist, geologists have realized the work of uh, importance of uh, Dr. Tony Hagen's geological work. And now they are, you see, they, uh, um, repeating or doing or conforming or whatever the research they are doing uh, on the geology of Nepal. Uh, very recently, a book by Midras Dital is on the geology of Nepal, and he has dedicated that book to Dr. Tony Hagen. And uh, he's now in the, uh, on the board, uh, executive member of the board, and very recently, we invited the members of Geological Society of Nepal and we are going to collaborate with them uh, what uh, we can do uh, in this field. But that's only at present I can mention about it. Thank you very much. I'd like to make a point to, to uh, I, I have to just, just a quick point please. Just, just because of what uh, Katrin just said and I felt she said it with a finality that there is no possibility of a Tony Hagen trail. I would uh, appeal to Katrin uh, and make this point that in large parts, because we know that the map that Professor Hagen made in his book of 1959, it has the sketch of all the 14,000 kilometers that he walked in nine years. Not 40, by the way, 14,000. Yeah, one four. Uh, I believe that there will be places that for somehow got missed by the infrastructure developed especially when they found a road would bypass a high pass so the road didn't get built and if there was no village in the high pass then that would possibly be still a section of the Tony Hagen trail. <laughs> I, I know a very nice pass which could be Tony Hagen trail. He did not find the pass itself and he got very angry. It, this is Namun pass and uh, there will no there will never be a road over there. I also crossed it. It's difficult to find the pass and uh, maybe this could be a very nice and probably in future for tourism this will, would be a very good alternative because now with the road uh, in the Marciandi Valley it's not more interesting to, to walk up and but if you can start in Gan Pohara or Siklis and cross the Namun Pass and come down, this would be a very good alternative for the tourist, trekking tourism. And, uh, Excellent. May I just say a uh, remark about the geology? I don't know, uh, I'm working now together with Professor Vishal Upreti and also the Nepal <coughs> Geological Society. And we are planning, or we are work now, on the third volume of geology on, of Western Nepal. For me, one of the worst things, okay, I, I have to, to look where is the manuscript, this is in German, this is in English, to put it together. But one of the very big um, problems I have is the name, is the, the road, the routing, the map, and the name of the villages. He used that time the map of the Survey of India in 
90, 30, or 28 something. And now I compare with the new map of the road of the department. And at least half of the names of the villages have changed. So it is very difficult for me. Oh, okay, this, he mentioned the, the, this village, and then I look on the new map. Oh, it could be this one. And this is a big work and very difficult because without this, nobody here has the map of uh, the survey of India. Without this, the geological uh, work is of no use because you don't know where it is. Thank you. Um, excellent uh, conversation, the two of you. <laughs> that was great because we got a little bit of the trail going. Um, I think we've got one more question in the back there, Bishal. Um, if you can stand, and then I'll turn it back to Deepak. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Bishal. I'm with Aditi Foundation. Thank you, Deepak. Your talk is always fascinating, and this one definitely has aroused um, interest in reading more of Tony Hagen. Uh, my question is, uh, um, actually, I want uh, additional more perspective uh, on the donors' bureaucracy and the infrastructure development. Donors' bureaucracy and the infrastructure development that you mentioned about, and you also gave the example of how uh, it had a, 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 a kind of negative impact on the Kulekhani development. Uh, my question is that now, since the donor seems to be kind of coming back to the infrastructure development realm in Nepal, what are the kind of two, one, two, three lessons to be learned from experience of 1970s and 80s uh, now that the donors are more focused on infrastructure development? So, lessons to be learned from. Thank you, Vishal. Okay. Okay. Great. I think uh, uh, some very interesting ones. I'll, you know, briefly lump them together. Trail. Govinda, thank you. I mean, this is uh, really important and goes back to what uh, Kanak, Catherine, Professor Jha have been also arguing about. Uh, you know, my quick response to Catherine would be, you know, you know, we're not going to be going and reviving those trails just for tourists. I think less. It is important, but I think we should be doing it for school children. And the reason is this is educational, you know. Take a, to a school group on a Tony Hagen trail. Like, okay, it might still have roads and it might still have all the kinds of things. But try retracing those steps. It'll, what it will do is it will, you know, um, uh, get these children to understand what their country is like. And what someone, you know, about you know, 50, 60 years ago uh, did. What the country was like at that time. And you probably get a much better... Uh, informed citizenry coming out of this. So I think, you know, the focus should be on school children also for the uh, Tony Hagen Foundation and the Tony Hagen Trail that we do. In which case, it doesn't matter if this has been ruined. You can tell the t children, look how it is ruined, you know. So this is a point to introduce alternative development paradigms, you know, and this uh, search for options, widening the options of development. And unless we train our new generation to think in these kind of of terms of wider option, I think we'll be, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, herding ourselves into, you know, past the cliff, you know, that's as far as I can see. Now, Professor Jha, you, you sent me that abstract of two critical papers by Tony Hagen uh, on your, on your, in your journals. Uh, Pratyus might like to, I'm not sure whether it's already included in your uh, bibliography, but there's really interesting two papers, very recent, uh, 1994, 96, I think, or something. And it's really well-written two papers on uh, uh, two of your uh, journal publications there, okay? Uh, then, um, this geology debates are, you know, it's they, they, like with hydropower, I guess, geology debates are also pretty passionate. And the fights are amazing. And because, uh, you know, someone once said, you know, why are academic fights so bitter? And the answer given was because the stakes are so small. Uh, uh, you know, geologists are just as bad as us hydropower engineers, I think, you know. But then, you know, for the, the again, my thinking goes back to the newer generation of scholars who should be aware of all these fights and debates and all that and come to their own conclusion. So I think this is where we should really be going at, okay. And uh, uh, Catherine, yeah, the names of villages have changed. You were talking about something 50 years ago when you were walking with your father there as a child, okay? I'm talking about today, you know, about four, four, four what, uh, a couple of months back. You know, 
I can't find the villages where I did work because now VDCs have become Gaupalikas and nobody knows what the bloody old name was the new one is like. It's really confusing. So this is part of life here in Nepal. There's nothing we can do about it. We just have to live with it and retrace things back and say this was what it was called before. Uh, Bishalji, I think this is a very important subject and a subject matter for really a major, you know, talk or a day-long seminar at least and all. You know, uh, I'm really scared of the donors coming back to infrastructure, as they say, especially hydropower. First, they have not learned any lessons from the fight on Arun 3 and all. They've taken all the wrong lessons. That's my uh, impression. Second, they're coming from a kind of a paradigm which goes completely counter to the kind of things that Tony Hagen or Hofton people like us have been arguing. That is capacity development led bottom up kind of a development I mean, whether it's hydropower whether it is tourism whether it is uh, well name anything okay <coughs> i'll give an example the donors since the 1990s uh, and worse in the 2000 what they prided themselves i know this personally with debates in london and washington and all kinds of places that i do they prided themselves on this whole thing about uh, pushing more money through the system okay uh, little realizing that in the process what they did was they corrupted the entire donor bureaucracy system. Now corrupted means, I mean not anybody just taking money from under the table, that really, that too but not primarily. Primarily what it did was it created institutions, for instance in Washington DC, and if you have dealt with any American contracts uh, on development, whether USAID or anything or MCA right now, okay, uh, you realize that the the contracts are so. You know, for someone like me with my kind of English, I can't understand the English. You know, the legalese is so tough to understand. It has created a whole tribe of what this is an American expression of what is called Beltway bandits. Washington DC has a beltway, ring road, the ring road they call beltway. Within that beltway there are all these uh, uh, companies, okay, where people and there's a swinging, uh, you know, revolving door. Uh, they work sometimes in USAID as uh, whatever experts and then they come back as consultants and set up these companies. And they are the only ones that know which word will fly, which has to be done. And as a result, these are the ones that get the million, 15 million dollar contracts. And then they would subcontract it out to organizations like mine or yours or something for $50,000, dollars hundred fifty if you're lucky, okay? But their contract is for $15 million. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was in Bangkok and as part of the Mekong River Commission and all that, and we found out that Stockholm Environment Institute in Bangkok had got a $150,000 uh, kind of a contract from a Beltway bandit, I uh, won't name it, you know, uh, which had contracted them out. They were very happy. They had done great work and I was sitting on the review. Until those guys quickly realized that the Beltway Bandit had actually got $15 million for that project, had paid Stockholm in Environment Institute 150000 you know, and what happened to the rest of the money, God knows, okay? Must have fed the American political process, okay? all these big million dollar donations, okay? Now, what I said at that point, and I'll end with that, <laughs> is I said, I'm so happy to hear this. You know, we Nepalese have no choice. Okay, somebody gives you a $20,000 contract, you're very happy, you get the work done. You know, we do that all the time. But to see that the Swedes get taken in that easily, I said, as a Nepali, I'm really happy. <laughs> and this is corruption. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Um, I won't go into uh, summarizing what um, Deepak supplied of his read on Tony Hagen's life and writings. But uh, it was an almost forensic examination, at least from uh, uh, Deepak's disciplinary perspective. And as Kanak uh, uh, nicely complimented with the rest of uh, Tony Hagen's uh, contributions. Um, I should say for a disagreeable person, Deepak, you only had one and a half disagreements with Tony Hagen. <laughs> that's, very, uh, that's very commendable. Um, but, um, you know, the ideas around uh, governance, the ideas around honest development, the commodification of culture, something that we have to keep in mind. I use the word commodification, but uh, cannibalism is also good. Um, the, uh, the openness to context, uh, and to me, this idea of openness comes from, not from rethinking, but from reimagining. And this whole idea of reimagining then uh, is rooted in our training, our socialization 
from school and of course uh, uh, in college and so on. I myself trained in politics and government, but I have found much to my chagrin that I know very little about the other disciplines because of the way we were taught. And uh, I'm rediscovering, uh, for example, anthropology and history. Uh, but um, I was glad to see that you began by noting that Tony Higgin as a geographer and geologist, I mean, this, his discipline was really uh, a multidiscipline and interdiscipline. And we can begin there and think about uh, memorializing the Tony Hagen Trail by the socialization we give, of course, to children and then so on to geology students. I thought there are several takeaways from it, but I love the takeaway about doing a day-long workshop on uh, donor dysfunction. I thought that would be excellent. And, you know, Bishal and I work together these days. We might take that forward. We'll see. As you all know, we brought out this book on kleptocracy in Nepal, which some of you must have heard about. The last page talks about how complicit development aid givers are in kleptocracy in Nepal. Happy to talk more about it at the break. Um, thank you, Deepak, so much uh, as a colleague uh, at the Baha for um, stimulating this conversation. Thank you, Catherine, for gracing us with your presence and your comments and for Kanak for provoking even more comment and conversation as he always does. And for all the others who ask questions, I invite you to cookies and tea and more interaction downstairs. Uh, just a reminder that the bibliography on Hagen's writings will be available within a month from Martin Chautari for those who are interested uh, in that. So on behalf of Nanda and Pamela Shrestha and the Social Science Baha, I'm now required to give Deepak a gift for his remarks here, Honorable Minister Deepak. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>